celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Centre de Recerca Matemática. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce now you, Professor Tamar Zikla from the Technical uh, University in Israel. Uh, Tamar Zickler belongs to this uh, young generation of researchers which have brought uh, new energy, deep insight and technical mastership uh, to all uh, standing uh, problems in mathematics and somewhat uh, making them fall one after the other in an incredible way. So it is a very nice thing that uh, she accepted to come to this invitation to give this talk. Uh, he, she has uh, many uh, distinctions and awards. Uh, she will be one of the invited speakers in the next ICM in Seoul. Uh, he, she was given the Erdos Prize uh, for uh, his um, solution of the inverse, what is called the Gower's inverse conjecture. And uh, it has to do with uh, these uh, new uh, developments about the structure of primes. Uh, connected to this uh, Green Tau theorem, and I think that uh, she will talk a little bit about this topic today. Thank you, Tama. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here in Barcelona. Last time I was here was more than 20 years ago. And um, um, happy birthday to the CRM. I wish CRM many more uh, fruitful years. Um, and what I want to talk about today is, uh, uh, is kind of tell you the story of this nice and kind of mysterious relation between uh, finding patterns in primes and um, dynamics on nil manifolds. So, um, okay, so let me, let me try to, let me start with a setting. So we denote by P the set of primes, um, and we ask the following basic questions. So we're giving a, a collection of K affine linear forms. So those are the psi i from one to K, and, um, we ask the very basic question. Um, so here's the first question we ask is, can we make all these, these um, linear, these affine linear forms, can we make them simultaneously prime? So this is one question we ask. Well, if we can do it, can we do it infinitely many times? And, um, and the second question is, uh, well, if we can do that, then the obvious second question, you know, how many, how, how many times, how many solutions can we find asymptotics? Um, so these are the two questions I want to address. Um, let me put in context, here is the very simplest case. So if we start with one simplest linear form or affine linear form is the case when psi of x is just equal to x. And then the first question is just asking whether we have infinitely many primes. So that's a over 2,000 year old theorem. Um, <clears throat> so we do have infinitely many primes. And this, but the second question was actually turned out to be much more difficult. And over 2,000 years later, this is the well-known prime number theorem that was proved by Hadamard and delavalle poussin is that, that, that we can actually count. We can ask how many prime numbers do we have small or equal than n? And the answer is that roughly we have n over n prime numbers. So this is the prime number theorem. And, and still, in, still in dimension one, in, in for, for one linear equation, so if here's an, an affine linear equation, so I have a constant b, so I look at ax plus b, and, and we can ask the question, can we have infinitely many primes of the form ax plus b? If you ask this, this is like asking whether you can find primes that are in a given, you're given an arithmetic progression, and you're asking whether you can find primes in this arithmetic progression. And the answer to that is a theorem of, a theorem of Dirichlet from, um, I guess, two, 200 years ago. Um, that you can always find primes in arithmetic progression so long as there is no obvious reason that you can't. So these obvious reasons are called local obstructions. If there is some prime that divides both A and B, then clearly you can't, you can't find infinitely many primes of the form AX plus B. But if, there is, if this doesn't happen, there's no stupid reason why, why, why you can't find primes, then, then there are infinitely many primes of this form. And, uh, uh, and combining this, res this result of Dirichlet with the techniques of the, of the prime number theorem, you can get actually asymptotics. You can ask, how many primes can I see in an, in an arithmetic progression? And the, the answer is, well, there are only phi of A, if phi is the euler totian function, there are only phi of A legal arithmetic progressions, and each one of them gets its fair share of primes. So this is, this is, this is just the answer for one, one equation. Um, for one linear form. Um, this is the 
number of, number, number of um, numbers that are co-prime to A. Okay, so th that would give you the legal arithmetic progressions where you can uh, hope to find primes. Okay, um, so, so the result I want to talk about is, is what was proved in a series of papers by Green and Tao, and one final one in joint work with Green and Tao, and, um, and we proved the following theorem. So the same, the same context that we start out with K linear forms and N variables, but we add this one, this extra condition, we assume that no two forms are affinely dependent. That means that they're linear apart. No, if you take any two forms, they're linear apart, are linearly independent. So X and X plus two are bad, because if you toss the two out, you get X and X, and those two linear parts are, are dependent. But for example, X, if you look at X, X plus D, X plus 2D, and X plus 3D, that's a four-term arithmetic progression. If you think of it as a form in two variables, in X and D, then this is okay, because the, 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 no two of them are linearly dependent. So, or, or you can add constants or whatever you want. So we rule out this condition, this, con this, this very interesting case of, of having X, X plus 2. But, but other, than that, um, other than that, we consider all, all other possible, um, possible uh, uh, configurations, and, and the theorem is um, that first we can have all these psi i x be simultaneously prime infinitely often, so long as there is no silly reason why you, why you can't do that, so there's no obvious obstruction to that, so this is the first one, and, and actually we can go further than that and actually calculate the asymptotic number, so there is, there's, we, there's some fixed number that depends on this in terms, an Euler product, you can Try to estimate it for, for a given question, and um, it's not. You, you can write it. You can quite easily for, or write down what the expression should be, and um, right. So so th this is this is these these are the results I want to talk about. But what I really want to describe is is the intertwining developments in ergodic theory, number theory, and combinatorics that's led to this theorem. So I want to go back kind of to where it's sort of give you a survey of ideas that led to, in the end, to understanding to, to these theorems. So, um, okay, so in the, on the number theoretic front, our, our starting point, well, our original starting point was Dirichlet's theorem, and, and uh, I guess Dirichlet's theorem would be one affinity form, but, but here is a, a theorem of Vinogrado from 1937, states that any sufficiently large odd number is a sum of three primes. So, how should you think of it? You should think of n as being fixed, and you're trying to solve an equation with three prime variables. You're trying, you fix n, and you ask, do we have three prime variables, p1, p2, v3, so that they solve this equation. If you were to make this equation more, make this question more difficult and toss one of the primes out, just ask, can I have, well, then it won't be odd, so you'd ask, can, does every, every even number, can every even number be expressed as a sum of two primes, then this is the well-known Goldbach conjecture, and it's wide open. Um, the weak Goldbach conjecture states that for any, any odd number greater than five should be, can be represented as a sum of three primes, so one equation, three variables, as the one over here, and it was solved for Vinograd, by, so solved by Vinogradov for odd enough, for, for large enough odd numbers, so for large enough numbers it was um, solved by Vinogradov, and very, very recently, last year, was brought down to its optimal value of five by Helpot. Um, and to put things in context, if you rephrase the results in the last slides in the, in the context of equations and, 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 and variables, then what, what we can do is solve any k equations in n variables so long as n is greater or equal than k plus two. So, um, and, and maybe I should just say, mention one remark, is that for one equation and three variables, the techniques that are used by Vinogradov and then optimized by Helfgott, they use this method called the circle method, which is kind of a variation and Fourier analysis. And we know now that you can't use these methods. It's not sufficient to solve these, to, to treat any, for, for larger k, for k equations and k plus two variables. And uh, okay, before, before we dive into, into the math, and just a comic relief of this XKCD comic about Goldbach conjecture, so I won't read it to you, I'll let you stare at it for maybe while I'm talking. And, uh, uh, and uh, if not, just look up at XKCD about the Goldbach conjectures. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah. Okay, so this is, these are the two, the two real ones, and then there is the very strong, very weak, and so on. So, okay. Um, right. Okay. Um, okay, so now, now, now back to math. Uh, right, it's late, so it's uh, time to have a laugh in there. <laughs> right. So on the, on the combinatorial, um, the, our, our starting point is going to be Semiretti's theorem from 1975 that states the following. So suppose you have a, a subset of the integers, E, is of positive upper density. What does that mean? That means that it, it's, if you take it intersect, intersect it with growing intervals, then, then it takes a substantial part. So say you take 1% of, of the integers. Um, then E contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Um, so this, is, yeah, here is, this is the expression for the upper density. And Semiretti's theorem is a, a, a difficult theorem. Um, let, me, let me start with, a, with a very, the easiest case of it, which is Roth's theorem. I guess this is my starting point, one, one step before that. Roth's theorem from 1953. This is just the case for a three-term progression. So this is the easiest, well, two-term two progression is not interesting. But three is already interesting. It's a pattern. And we, and, 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 I want to describe to you Roth's argument for, for finding three-term progressions, since it's, this, is the, this is kind of the base point for, what, for the developments later on the combinatorial front. So here's the idea of the proof. So suppose you start with, suppose you have a subset E of a progression P, and suppose you have an arithmetic progression of size n and some subset E inside it of, inside it of size delta n, and um, you want to find progressions inside E. Okay, so our starting point would be that this p is just the interval between 1 and n, but we can do this for any progression, p. And we want to find three points, x, x plus d, x plus 2d, all inside the set e. Okay? So here is the argument. The argument goes either, well, suppose for example, suppose for, for, for a minute that you had this progression p, and in each, for each point in the progression, you were to flip a coin, and uh, a delta coin, so decide whether the element is inside the progression with probability delta. Then you would, typical set would be of size delta times n, and if you ask yourself how many three-term progressions you expect to find, well, you expect to find roughly delta cubed n squared arithmetic three-term progressions inside this set. So, so how does the argument go? So I said, either, either you're close to a random case, so you have lots of progressions, delta, delta cubed n squared progressions. This is, if, if n is large enough, then you have many progressions. Um, so this would be the same as the number as you would have in a, in a random set of density delta. Or if that doesn't happen, then something, there, there is some structure inside. So what happens? Then you have an increased density. Your set has larger density on some sub-progression of size, say, n to the one-third. Okay? So so if I, don't have, if, if I don't have lots of progressions, like in a random set, then there is some sub-progression, still very large, of size n to the power of one-third. And on that sub-progression, my density is larger. Okay? I'm more concentrated on that sub-progression. Now, if you take this argument and you iterate it, then after 1 over c delta times, if you iterate it 1 over c delta times, then, then at the very end, you reach density 1. So you're your, uh, uh, your, your set is a full progression, and, and, and then you're done. Okay, so either you have lots of progressions, or you have a very long progression after many, 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 um, after finitely many steps. So this is, this is, this is Roth's argument, and of course the, the key issue is how do you get this, this increased density? How do you interpret the fact that you don't look like a random set into some extra density and a sub-progression? And, and the, way, the way this is done is, is using Fourier analysis, once again, for three term, one equation, three variables, the same. This is, this is, these set of techniques work using Fourier analysis, and you show that, this, this, the, the, that one e minus delta has a large Fourier coefficient, and you can interpret that. You, you translate this information into increased density. And I'll return to, to, to this point later. Um, OK, so this is, this is Roth's theorem. And Semiretti's proof of this theorem goes by, by for, for, for the larger progressions, um, longer progressions goes via different, different methods, so I, I won't describe that. 
Um, but I do want to, want to my, my next step chronologically is to describe to you the ergodic approach to this theorem. So, um, so t a couple of years after, after Samaretti proved his theorem, Furstenberg came up with an ergodic theoretic proof of Samaretti's theorem. And, um, and let me just try to describe to you the ideas behind, behind his proof of the theorem. So, so here, is, here, here is the idea. The, oh, oh, one, of the, one of the first ideas was of this observation of Furstenberg is that you can take a question about, his arbitrary loves, about a subset of the integers and trying to find patterns inside this subset and translate them into questions about a dynamical system with some distinguished set. And you're trying to see whether you return to the set at some nice set of times. So how does this work? So you have a, you have a so suppose you start with some set E of positive density in the integers. And, and well, then there is a probability space, x, x b mu. This is a probability, this is the phase space, and mu is a measure. So we can find a probability space, a transformation T that preserves the measure. So the measure is kept, is preserved under, under this transformation. And a distinguished set A with positive measure so that the following happens. If you return to the set A at a nice set of time, so I return here after T to the N, T to the 2N, up to T to the KN. If I return to the set A after a nice set of times, so if the measure of this intersection is large, then the original set E intersects its translations, and the same translation is non-empty. So, so this, this thing down here exactly says that E contains a k plus 1 term arithmetic progression. OK, so yeah. What's the relation of the probability phase to the set E? That's that. OK, there is a way to construct. I'm not explaining the construction. But there's a very natural construction, OK? I can explain it to you later. <laughs> um, uh, but, but the point is that there is a natural construction that associates to a set E, a measure space, and a, a, a distinguished subset of positive measure, and a distinguished measure, OK? So a, a, a measure space and a distinguished set, so that this, this relation holds. And if you get something like that, then you have a new problem. So suppose you're looking for arithmetic progressions, then given a probability measure preserving system. So I wrote ergodic, and you can assume that. I don't want to get into what this condition means. But, and um, and given, given a subset A of positive measure, find an n so that this intersection, this, the measure of this intersection is large. If I can do that, I, I'm given a, an arbitrary measure space, an arbitrary set of positive measure. Suppose I could show that I can always return to it, and I can always find and so that I return to the set A at a nice sequence of times. Well, if I can do that, then I can solve the, the original question in, for, for arithmetic progressions and integers. Now, of course, you, you can argue now that, um, that what did I do? Well, I took a, uh, an arbitrary subset inside the integers and replaced it with an arbitrary set of positive measure in a measure-preserving system. So, so how am I better off? Um, and the answer is that you can hope to use structure theorems in, in, in measure-preserving systems, hope to use that to your advantage in trying to prove a, re, a, a result of this type. So, so here, is, here is what Furstenberg proved. So after having, having shown this correspondence principle between sets of positive density to sets of positive measure and return times to them, um, Furstenberg shows that the, not only you can find one end, but actually you can find lots of ends of this form. And you, over n of, of, these, of these, the measures of these intersections, then the limit of that is positive. So obviously, you can find many ends for which this is true. And, and as I said, the key idea, the key thing is, is that you, one can hope to, to use structure of, 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 of measure-preserving systems. And what, what Furstenberg does in order to prove this thing is he tries to study the arbitrary measure-preserving system x via morphisms to simpler measure-preserving systems. So you, there are two, two, two approaches. You can try to study a system by subsystems. This is one approach. Furstenberg's approach says try to understand a system via images of it, so morphisms to other simpler systems. And let me show you what Roth's, what Roth's theorem looked like in the, in the, in the, um, from an ergodic point of view. So let me show so, yeah. Is that true for all of these? What is true? 
for any A, for any A, this is true, any A with positive measure. Yeah, that's the point. Well, I, wanna, I, I wanted to say something about any set E. <laughs> so hopefully I can say something about any set A. I, I have no control over what the set I get. You can cook up whatever you want. Um, okay, so how does Furstenberg's proof for Roth's theorem go? So he shows that there exists a, a morphism. So morphism is a, is a, a, a natural map of measure-preserving systems. So it, it intertwines with the, with the actions in the two systems. So, so there exists a morphism x to some special system that I will denote z of x. Um, whoops, that jumped fast. Hang on. <laughs> such that this z of x is what, it, what we call a Kronecker system. So what is a Kronecker system? It has this extra structure. It's a compact abelian group. Z is a compact abelian. So in your mind, you can think of a circle, of a circle and, and z is a compact abelian group. You have the Haar measure on it, so you can think of the circle with the Haar measure. And your transformation is rotation by a group element. So again, the example that should sit in your mind is a circle rotation. Okay. So this would be an example of a Kronecker system. So there exists a special Kronecker system, and it's the largest such Kronecker system. So it has this universal property that if you have any other Kronecker system and a map from x to y, then it will factor through this big factor, z of x. But how is this related to the Roth question, to the question of finding three-term progressions? Well, it satisfies this really nice property this type of average. So look at this average, stare at it for a moment, and this is very, if you replace, if you put 1a instead of the function f here, it calculates exactly the intersection that we were looking for, the intersection of a with t minus na and t minus 2na. If you want to calculate any such average, it doesn't have to be a characteristic function of a set, then it's the same. You can first take your function, project it onto the factor, Okay, there is a natural projection. If you have a ma map between, natural map between two spaces, there is a natural map between the function spaces. So I can project this function, these functions onto the factor and calculate the average error. Asymptotically, it's going to be the same. Okay, so this is, this is, this is, the, this is the special property of, this, of, this, of this, uh, this z of x, this Kronecker system. And the key point is that this projection operator is positive. So if you have a positive function, then the projector, projection is also a positive function. And the integral stays the same. This is the natural property of a projection. And um, now if you take the function 1a, this is the function we're looking for, then, then this, is, this average down here is something that is easy to calculate on an abelian group. You use Fourier analysis. Again, Fourier, for Roth's theorem, you, can use, you have a, something abelian coming in the picture. You can use Fourier analysis in order to calculate this and show that, actually calculate the limit and show that it's positive. Not just the limit, inf, but just the limit itself. OK, so, so let me say something more about this z of x. z of x is called the Kronecker factor of x, the Kronecker factor, since it's the biggest. And, um, and the way one constructs it is using the eigenfunction of, this, of, of your transformation, t. So what does that mean? So what, how, let, me, let me demonstrate how this is done. So suppose you have an eigenfunction, then psi of tx is lambda psi of x. This is an eigenfunction of the system. Then, and suppose that it's normalized. You can, if the system is ergodic, you can normalize it to take values in the unit circle. Then I claim that if you have an eigenfunction, then it gives you a natural map between your, your, your space x and a circle rotation. And how is that? Well, here's the diagram. On top, you go by t. If you have this psi map onto, S, onto, the, onto the circle, then moving t with t on, the, on top over here is exactly multiplying by lambda on the bottom. So if you have an eigenfunction, you get a natural map to, you net, you get a natural map to a circle rotation. OK? OK. Um, and if, if you have no non-trivial eigenfunctions, if, if, if the only eigenfunctions are the constant functions, then, um, then this, this, this factor, this, this z of x, this system is trivial, and we call the system weak mixing. We call the system x weak mixing. And, and what happens then, well, in that, if this is trivial, if this factor is trivial, then the, the projection is just the integral. And, what ha and this average that we're trying to look like, to, we're trying to calculate, is just the integral squared, the integral cubed. 
So you can think of it, this is, this is like, the, the, like, like the random case. So we want to think of this statement over here as the points x, t to the nx, and t to the qnx as being independent, asymptotic and average. Okay? They're not truly independent, but they're independent asymptotically and average. So what is, what is, um, what is the, the, the claim that, that we have? What does the claim about the Roth theorem say? Well, if these points are not asymptotically independent on average, then the obstruction to this lies in an abelian group rotation factor. So in your mind, you should have this picture. This is the big space X, where you don't know anything about. But there is a map from X to this very nice structure system, which is a group rotation. So you can think of it as a circle. Down on the sieves over what happens down there, everything is independent. This is what Furstenberg's proof of Roth's theorem said. Yeah. For my camera. Sorry. That's better, isn't it? No? Oh, uh, OK. And, and clearly, if you have something like that, if you have a map into, onto a system that, that satisfied, that had, onto, onto a non-trivial group rotation system, then you don't expect these points, x, t to the nx, and t to the 2 nx, to be independent, because they, they will always have this condition coming from this rotation on the bottom. OK? So, um, so this, this gives rise to, to a, uh, this idea of Furstenberg gives rise to a very natural definition for this type of, yeah? But all the work you got both for P and P squared. Yeah, yeah I'm, 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 I'm getting there. This, the Roth theorem is only works for, this abelian group rotation factor only works for, for three-term progressions. In our mind, it's like the, the Roth theorem, right? Like the Fourier analysis. Something abelian corresponds to three-term. Yeah, OK. Um, so, so we define the notion of, of uh, k characteristic factor. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a complicated expression. You probably won't remember, but what should you keep out of it? It says you want to calculate some complicated average on an arbitrary space you know nothing about. Okay? Specifically, this average over here calculates something that is related to, in this case, k plus 1 term progressions. Okay? You don't, but the ar space is arbitrary. You know nothing about it. What this says is, this definition says, or this, what, what is this definition looking for? It's looking, you want to have um, a, a factor, y is a k characteristic factor, if instead of calculating the average, this complicated average in the space, you can first project your function onto a, a, a simpler, onto this other system y, and do the calculation there. Okay, so, so here are some examples. Of course, the space X itself is always K characteristic, because if I projected onto the space X, I didn't do anything. So this is zero, and just, just the term information, this inf there's no information in that. The key is to try to find a good, a good place to calculate the average, okay? This is, and this is gonna be the theme in, 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 in the entire, in, in all the developments coming forward. And here's, here's a second example. This, if you just look at the one case here, the, the, where, where k equals 1, this is just this 2 average over here, then the trivial system is y is 1 characteristic. Um, so what, what does that mean? This is exactly the statement of the mean ergodic theorem. If you try to calculate this average, this is the average that corresponds to k equals 1, then this converges to the integral square. This is the, the mean ergodic theorem. So base case is mean ergodic theorem. Trivial cases, the, there's x is characteristic for itself. And Furstenberg's input in for this question is that the Kronecker factor is two characteristic. If you want to put k equals two, three-term progressions, there's no way to get the numbers right. So k equals two, three-term progressions, then you have this abelian, you have this abelian um, group rotation factor. So here is, here is a recap of what Furstenberg's proof of Roth's theorem looks like. Well, either you're, in, in, I want to phrase it in, this, in the way that I phrased Roth's idea, or Roth's proof of Roth's theorem. So either your system is weak mixing, in which case the average is very, the, the, what, everything is very easy to calculate, and you have lots of progressions like you had before. You, you, have, you know exactly what the limit is, was the integral cubed. Or there is a morphism from x onto a non-trivial group rotation factor. This is this Kronecker factor. There is a special obstruction coming from group rotation factor, and to prove his the, the general theorem, what 
Furstenberg does is he relativizes this relation between weak mixing and structure. If you don't have weak, if you don't have this randomness, then some structure emerges, and he constructs this universal sequence of factors, um, each one satisfying that either if the case factor would satisfy that either X is so-called relatively weak mixing. There is a natural definition of this, and I don't, I won't have to prove it to explain it here. But there's a natural, natural notion of of relative weak mixing and natural notion of structure, or there is a morphism from X onto a non-trivial isometric extension of ZKX. Now, what this means exactly doesn't matter. What it, what you should think in your mind is the same relationship between either I'm mi weak mixing or I have a group rotation factor. So now I want to do this above some other factor that I have. I have some base system. Either I'm relatively weak mixing or I have some structure. This structure is an isometric extension. And it's sufficient, sufficient structure to not to calculate the average, but to show this recurrence property, to show that you have this limb inf that is positive. So this is, this is how Furstenberg proves his, uh, his, his theorem. And, and just, just to mention that, that the trivial, if Z0x if, is just a trivial system, and um, Z1x, this one, is, is the Kronecker factor. Um, and the key thing about these factors that I should have mentioned is that they are k-characteristic. This is why he can prove the theorem. They, they, are, they, are, they are sufficient. You can see they are a tower of, of, of nice some struct extensions with some structure, and, and you can prove, um, he uses this structure to prove his theorem. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's sufficient structure to proving Sam Reddy's theorem. Um, okay. So, so here's, a, here's another thing about this Kronecker factor, is that it turns out to be the best factor possible. What does that mean? Um, if you have any other two characteristic factor, any other place you can, you can place where you can calculate the average, then and the map between x to y would factor, the, the map between x to z would factor through y. So it's, it's kind of the minimal place to calculate the average, optimal. You can think of z of x, this, this abelian group rotation factor, that's the optimal place to calculate the average. You can't go any smaller than that. OK, but the other ones that he constructs, these, these k, zk that I described before, they turn out not to be optimal for k greater than 1. Um, and this brings out a very natural question. The question is, what are the, what are the, what are the universal characteristic factors? Where, where is the optimal place? If I'm trying to understand k term progressions, where is the optimal place I can calculate the average I'm looking for? So we already know that for, aver for three term progressions, the, the optimal place is um, a group, a gr an abelian group rotation. All I need to do understand group of abelian group rotations. And, um, uh, but, but for higher k, the question is, what can you say for higher k? So, so we want to classify what are the obstructions that, 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 uh, that prevent these points, x, t to the n, x to t to the, well, I don't know why I wrote k plus 1. And x, you're preventing them from roaming about freely. Okay? So, so you, you have that picture in your mind, your x and the factor below, and what prevents it from prevents these points from, from roaming about freely. So let me demonstrate to you what happens when, when you try to go one step up. Remember, I told you for, for three-term progressions and Vinogradov's question, all of that comes Fourier analysis. And I want to show you that this is not enough. This is not good enough if you want to go for, if you're looking for four-term progressions. Then this is no longer true. Um, so here is, here's a new obstruction if you're looking for four-term progressions. So look at this, this system. So this is the two-dimensional torus, or if you want, S1 cross S1. So I'm looking at an additive notation now. And, and look at this tr transformation. Well, here at the bottom is just group rotation. This is the regular. This is like the Kronecker factor that I had before. But I have this twist on the, on the on top. So I have W plus 2Z plus alpha. And if you iterate this, if you do this n times, then you have a linear part coming here. This is n alpha. But you have a quadratic term that pops out in this, in, this, in this second coordinate. And you have this special relation that you can express the point y as if you, if you just sum these coordinates up, you can express the point y as there is some connection between these, these four, so some very nice algebraic connection between these four points. So here is how this thing should look in your mind. Here are the points 
x, x plus n alpha, x plus 2 n alpha, x plus 3 n alpha. This is what, oh, this should be z. Do you see? Maybe it is in my, but it's kind of difficult to see in the resolution. I think it should be z. This should be z, z plus n alpha, this should be the first coordinate. This is what happens on the first coordinate, on the circle downstairs. This system is a product of, of, of so I think above each point down here stands a circle on the top. And here are the, here are the points. Now, in, when I, if I'm just looking for three term progressions, if I'm ignoring this last line over there, then these points are free. There's no restriction about, above what happens down here. But if I'm looking for four points, I have this new restriction. This, there's this. There's no relation between. Can you hear? There's no relation between these three points. But if I'm looking for the fourth one, it's already algebraically connected to the previous three ones. Now, if you have a system, if your system is like this system, or your system has a map to this kind of system, then this would come up as a new obstruction for trying to look for four-term progressions, a new system you need to understand. But it turns out that it's not the only one. This, this, these are not the only obstructions for four-term progressions. And here is where nil systems make their first appearance. So what is a nil system? Well, suppose you're, look at a, look at a, look at a, a, a measure preserving y, system y, which is of this form. Well, you have n mod gamma, where n is a two-step nilpotent group. So let me, let me click quickly and then give you an example. So I think in your mind, an example that should sit in your mind is for this n to be the three-dimensional Heisenberg group. Okay, so this is a th two-step nilpotent group. It's second commutators annihilate. So this is the example you should have in your mind. And gamma is a lattice inside. So if these are the, the example, here is an example you should keep in mind is this, this Heisenberg group over R with mod, mod its Z points. It's points when you have all coordinates taken to be integers. So this gives you something that is called a two-step nil manifold. And you look, your transformation is Trans you fix an element in your group and you rotate, okay? Or you multiply on the left by this element. So, so G gamma goes to A G gamma. So this is a, called a two-step nil system. And topologically, this thing looks like, again, so if, if you look just at what happens on the above diagonal, on, ignore the third coordinate at the top, this is just a two-dimensional torus. If you multiply these matrices, this looks like just, this is just a, a, a two-dimensional torus with rotation with alpha beta, the, the vector alpha beta. But there's a twist on this third coordinate. So topologically, this looks like a circle bundle over a two-dimensional torus. So this is the picture here, because nice, nice to have pictures. Um, but the, the nice thing about this, the, the new thing to observe is that in this system, so here's what happens downstairs. Downstairs, you have this z, z plus n times the vector alpha beta. This is the two-dimensional torus with a regular group rotation on the bottom. And this demonstrates what happens on the top. On the top, we have the same kind of relation that we had before. Not a very, not, not this very nice for, formula. I can't write to you, write down the nice formula. But it is true that g gamma, or if you want the fourth one, is determined by the first three. Any three determine the fourth one. So if these guys are not free on the sieve above what happens in the chronicler downstairs, so these things also should come up as obstructions in trying to understand four-term progressions. And the beautiful theorem of kahn's lazine and Furstenberg and Weiss is that these are the only obstructions. So like the, the Kronecker system, the same role that the Kronecker system played below, played before for three-term progressions, these two-step nil systems play for four-term progressions. If you want to understand more a lot of this, if you want to understand four-term progressions and you live in their ergodic world, then what you really need to understand or to, to, to have is, is how orbits behave in a, in a nil manifold. And this is well understood. Okay? So if you, it's, like, it's not, not exactly for you. It's not, you can't use it, you do that using just Fourier analysis, but it's still well understood. Okay. Um, right, so, so, uh, so I'm giving you a chrono chronological um, survey of how things happened and how, how these developments happened. So, so this, is, this theorem is from the 90s, and it turned out that it's turned out to be difficult to, to generalize this to, to higher k. Um, so we pause in the ergodic story and jump back to combinatorics. So we're back in the combinatorics story, and now we're trying to understand 
um, uh, comes Gowers and um, he tries to, un to generalize this original argument that I showed you at the beginning, Roth's argument for, for our defining um, three-term progressions. So I told you, Samaretti's proof was completely different. But Gowers has this new idea. He's trying to generalize the same kind of structure of the proof that we had before. So, so what does Gowers do in order to do that? Um, so, so here's what, we, you, what one wants to calculate. So I will write APK is just a shorthand notation for arithmetic progressions of length, well, actually k plus 1. OK, so this is the average. I'm, and, and this expected value here is just an average. I'm averaging over x and d. OK, so I'm averaging over all x and d of this expression that I have over here. So if my function f were the characteristic function of a set, then this would calculate the average number of, of arithmetic progression or, or uh, normalized. Okay. So, so what does Gowers do? Well, he defines, uh, he defines these creatures that are called the Gowers norms that I'll explain to you what they are. Um, so here, here, is, here is how you define them. Well, suppose you have a function on z mod nz. So I will identify the interval between 1 and n with z mod nz. So suppose you have a function from z mod nz to the complex numbers. You can define a notion of discrete differentiation. So how can you differentiate? You pick an element of the group, h. And you, this thing over here is like differentiating, like a multiplicative derivative in direction h. So I, it's like a directional derivative in direction h, and it's a multiplicative type derivative. So it's not f of x plus h minus f of x, but I multiply it by the complex conjugate. And what do Gower's norms do? Well, they take a function f, they differentiate it in k different directions. OK, so I, I, it, I, I differentiate it k times, and then I average over everything I can. So I average over x, h1, h2, and so on through hk. And I call this thing the Gower's norm. Well, he called it the uniformity norms, but we call it nowadays Gower's norms. And they turn out to be norms when k is greater than 1. <coughs> Otherwise, they're just semi-norms. And, and let me say just a few, well, how, are you can, well, how are these creatures, how are they connected to the question that we're asking? Well, um, before I say that, let me say just let me just give you two two observations regarding this expression here. So here is one observation. Suppose your function were um, a true, where the form e to the two pi i q x, where q of x is a true polynomial of degree smaller than k. Well, if you take this iterated derivative, then after k times, this is going to be one. This is going to annihilate. Uh, because you have to make it homogeneous. So you have 2 to the k. Yeah, because each time is 2. Each, each time you differentiate, you multiply by 2. So just to make it homogeneous. Um, so if you have a true polynomial here, then this is exactly 1. And then the Gower's norm is 1 and vice versa. So it behaves, it behaves like a derivative for polynomials. If you differentiate it many times, then and it's a polynomial or a polynomial in the phase. We call it phase polynomial. Then it will annihilate. So this is one thing. Second thing is suppose your function were a suppose your function were just taking values plus minus one and you were to flip a coin on whether it's plus or minus one, then typically the Gower's norm would be very small. So what do I want you to keep out of these two points? If you're a very structured function like a polynomial or a phase polynomial, then your Gower's norm is very large. It's one. Okay, so I'm, I will consider only functions that are between bounded in, in absolute value by one. So it can't be greater than one. So if you're a true polynomial, this is one. And if you're far from polynomial, you're a random function, no structure at all, then your Gower's norm is small. And how is this all related to my question? Well, the key point, the key observation of Gower's is that if two functions are close in the Gower's norms, if f minus g u k, if, the Gors, if in the Gower's norm they're close, then they have approximately the same number of progressions. Okay? Then if I, if, I, if I can count progressions for this function, then I can count for this one. So how does Gower's argument go now? Well, suppose you have a, a subset of uh, E of size delta n. Then again, if, if 1 E minus delta, so you norm, we normalize this is this is the, the uh, think of this as delta times the constant function. If 
this function has small Gower's norms, this means that the number of arithmetic progressions for 1e e is the same as the number of, approximately the same as the number of arithmetic progression for the constant function delta. But the constant function delta, everything is very easy to calculate, so it's just delta to the k plus 1. It's like the random case, like the random count of, of progressions. And, um, okay, so here is the idea. Either you have the number of k plus 1 term progressions are like the random case, which is like delta to the k plus 1, or this thing is large. This, is, this Gower's norm is large. This is, this is the same type of idea like Rotha's idea. The only problem is, is how do you interpret this condition? What does it mean for this to be large? So when is it large? When is the Gower's norm of a function large? This is, this is the key point that Gower's well, it's a 100, uh, more than 100 page long paper and deals with the fact how can you analyze how you, you know something about these partial derivatives of the function f, how can you pull out some structure on the function f outside of that to get this increased density? And this is what Gowers proves. He proves what we call a local inverse theorem for the Gowers norms. So I'll explain local in a minute. So he shows that if you have, so this means that I'm greater than some constant depending on delta. So you think of n as being very large and delta is fixed. Okay, so if the Gower's norms is bounded away from zero, then your function f correlates, it has some type of polynomial behavior on a progression p of size n to some small power t. So for my thinking, Local means, um, local means that t here is smaller than 1. So the, I want, global would mean something that I know on, a, on the scale of that I'm asking, n. And local is some small power of n. So I can find some correlation of my function f on this. It correlates with the polynomial on, on, on this short, short or long, depending on which question you're trying to ask. You answer, but for, the, for finding progressions, it's sufficient. It's the same type of argument. Remember n to the one-third? After finitely many times of doing something like this, well, you can, if you know this, this type of correlation, you can get an increased density and a sub-progression using the fact that you understand the equidistribution properties of this, these polynomials, mod 1, of, so these, these, this thing mod 1. So you can get, so the argument is that once you get this, the argument is exactly the same as in Roth's theorem. So this was Gower's idea. Okay, and I'll, I'll get back to, to this quite soon. Well, I should, when, it, when, am I, when should I finish? <laughs> so, so the next, next advancement was, that was in, the, in the ergodic theoretic world, and in the ergodic theoretic world, uh, uh, the, there was the question of classifying these K characteristic factors. I told you that for two, it's the, Abelian group rotation factor, and for three, there is this theorem that shows that the two-step nil systems come in the picture. And the universal four characteristic factors, this is for five-term progressions, four <laughs> characteristic factors, um, they were shown to be three-step pro is for inverse limit, but same, same idea, uh, three-step nil systems. Um, so this was shown by Host and Kra and, and, and in my thesis. And, um, and it turns out that the methods, so there were different methods in, in these two works, and they turned out to extend to all k. And um, now we know that the universal k characteristic factors um, are always of this form, of, 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 an, of the form of a nil system. So moral of this theorem says the following. If you want to understand k term progressions, what you really need to understand is k step nil systems. These are like these, think of Heisenberg, like Heisenberg matrices, but of a higher dimension. Okay, these systems are the systems you need to understand. And just, just to show you, these were the, the Furstenberg factors, were these factors that were characteristic, they were good enough, but not optimal. And, from, and then you have the series of optimal factors, yk through y2, and they, they, co they coincide for Z1. This is the Kronecker factor. This is the abelian group rotation factor. But once you go on top of that, the, these are the factors that first of all constructs, which are larger than what one actually really needs, which are these very nice algebraic structured factors that are nil systems. Okay. Uh, right. So next step in the story, let me try. So I, I'm sure many of you, or 
at least you've heard some account of the Green Tau theorem, which is by now, I guess, 10 years old. But let me describe it to you in one slide from a characteristic factor point of view. Because this is the way, I, what I want you to take out of this is, is this idea of trying to find a good place to calculate an average. You need to calculate some average, and you want to find a good place to calculate it. This is the idea of a characteristic factor. So what, what do Green and Tau do from this perspective? Well, first they introduce some combinatorial, you need to introduce some combinatorial notion of factor and projection on a factor. Not so easy because think you only have finite space, so, so you can only do things approximately, so you introduce the notion of approximate factor and approximate pro projection. If you do that, then what you need to do is find a convenient k characteristic factor. Now, if we take the Gower's point of view on things, then what do we need to do? Well, we start out with a, with a character, so, so, uh, so this, is, this is a subset E of the primes. I, if I just look at the, at the characteristic function 1 E of n, then it's not a good function to work with because it's the primes are of density 0 inside the integers, so all averages are trivial. So there's the, the, good, the good normalization that comes from the prime number theorem is to have this, this, this bump of log n next to 1 and so we look at this modified, modified characteristic, uh, characteristic function, and suppose we find a good factor, and, and this is pi, and we have this notion of projection, so pi star would be this projection onto the factor, then what does the Gower's, what does the Gower's philosophy say? Well, what, if we can show, if we can find some factor like this so that the distance between these two functions in the Gower's norm is small, then they have approximately the same number of progressions. So this is the count of k plus one term progressions here. It's approximately the same as this one here. And what Green and Tao do is they manage to construct such a factor which is good enough. Good enough for, for, for them is a factor of bounded functions. These functions are not bounded. Okay? As n grows, log n goes to infinity. But if they find a characteristic function of a factor of functions that are bounded, then they're back in, they, they can apply Samaretti's theorem, which is where we started. Okay, so from a characteristic factor point of view, this is what they do, and this allows me to introduce what, what is the new, new thing that comes in the picture. Now, it's the same philosophy. We have some characteristic factor that works, but we want the optimal one. Okay, we want the best place to, find, to, calculate, to calculate the average. Okay. If, if you can find the best place that has some nice structure, then perhaps you can calculate asymptotics, actually calculate limit, as we could do in the Kronecker case. This is, this is, this is the point. And, um, and then we're back to this question. Can we have some global theorem, some nice theorem, telling us when, when this Gower's norm is large? So I remind you, we had the local Gower's norm theorem, so, which was proved by Gower's that you have these obstructions the function looks like a polynomial or correlates with a polynomial at scale n to the t, okay? But we want something that happens at scale n. So motivated by the role of nil systems in the study of progressions, Green and Tau conjectured what is known as the inverse conjecture for the Gower's norm, that global obstructures at scale n should come from these nil, something that is connected to nil manifolds, like it does in ergodic theory. And um, so here's quickly what that means. So you have, what, they come from something which we call nil sequences. So a nil sequence would be some sequence g of n, which comes naturally from looking at some function on an orbit on a nil manifold. So this is f of a to the n gamma. I'm doing this quickly because I think I'm, am I out of time? Did I start late? Hopefully. Uh, I'm still in my time frame? Okay. So, 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 so if n mod gamma is this nil k-step nil manifold, and you take some nice function, say, with some nice Lipschitz constant bounded, uh, some, some, uh, there are many ways you can describe uh, what a nice function is, but, but doesn't fluctuate too much. So you have, um, you have, you, you can form a sequence by evaluating this function at an orbit of some, well, in, in here I'm, I'm evaluating at the orbit of the trivial coset. Okay, so I formed this function. This is a k-step nil sequence, and the inverse conjecture says that, for the Gower's norm, says that if, you, if your, your function has a large Gower's norm, then you correlate with one of these guys, with one of these sequences that 
come from from a from a um, uh, from a nil system, in a sense, philosophically, it's very close to, to, to what we had in the in the erotic theoretic case. Um, and this bounded complexity is something that has to do with both the limited constant of the function and the dimension of the nil manifold. So there are all these things that come 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 give God given to you from this constant that you're given over here. Okay, not God given, but delta given. <laughs> By, by whatever, whatever this, uh, this thing is given to you. This thing will produce some manifold of bounded, um, some dimension that is bounded by delta, or some Lipschitz constant that is bounded by some terms of delta. Everything is, everything is given by this constant that is hiding here that I wrote by this, in this notation. Um, and this is what we prove. So we prove the inverse conjecture for the Gower's norm is true. So on global scale, indeed, the, the obstruction comes from from, nil, from, from these nil sequences, and we actually show that this is the optimal place. This is an if and only if condition. If you correlate with one of those creatures that I wrote in the previous slide, then definitely you have uh, a large Gower's norm. That's the easier part. But the difficult part is to show that this thing is, is globally true. Um, and now if you want to get back to the original question, we were looking for asymptotics for finding solutions and equations and problems. So how do we do that? Well, what we need to do is to calculate the projection of this function, the characteristic function of the primes with its um, modified version. So I need, I need to give the right, right, um, right bump of long e, log n. So what we need to do is to calculate what the projection of this thing is onto this combinatorial nil factor. Okay? If I can calculate that, then I, on the nil factor, I can, try to, I can calculate the average. And this is, this is one of the, of those, I said a series of, of papers by Green and Tiles. So one of them calculates this thing. So they show that the projection, they calculate the projection onto this combinatorial nil factor. And it turns out to be, the projection turns out to be in a much smaller factor, which is kind of what comes from, pure, from purely periodic functions, which are of bounded period. And this allows one to get this Euler product that I said at the beginning. This allows one to calculate the, 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 the asymptotics. So, um, so I think this is, a, this is a good place to stop. But I do have, I, I did do some, some kind of a graph try to explain to you, to show you the ideas that sort of came into this. Because we're at a nice place. It's nice to be at a, a kind of a nice place in the theory where things, you can look back and say, okay, these are the ideas. And, and this is how they came, came in the picture. So, so if you start with Semiretti's theorem in, in 75, then comes the ergodic theoretic proof of Semiretti's theorem in 77. And then this idea, this, these, this is the first time these, this, this nilpotent obstruction come in the picture are through the ergodic work in uh, Furstenberg, Weiss, and Kohns, and Lezine. Um, then comes the, the, the uh, Gower's proof of Semiretti's theorem, which introduces these Gower's norms and the idea of trying to kind of find correlation with some structured function. In that case, it's a polynomial on a small scale. Um, then there is the, the classification of, of, of general characteristic fa factors for K-term for K progressions and the role of nilpotency for that. Um, then comes the Green-Tau theorem for the primes. Um, then actually, um, yeah, then, then, then there is a, uh, uh, it actually comes next, um, the U3 theorem, which corresponds to four-term progressions, which corresponds to the kohns lezine result over here. That was proved by Green and Tau and by Samoradnitsky for, well, Samoradnitsky for, for F2 to the N and Green and Tau for Zn and Fp to the N for P not 2. So he's a computer scientist and he's interested only in 2. And they had a problem with two, but he was able to fix that. Uh, well, he did it independently. Um, but then, but then came this. Um, this, this came this. If, if you look, if you look Gower's norm up on the internet, then you'll find that there is this big. It'll come up as big as like a, the inverse conjecture for the Gower's norms over finite fields is wrong. So if you ask the same question over f p to the n instead of z mod n z, then 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 there was a counterexample that was found by um, Green and Tau, and independently, Lovett, Mishulam, and Samordnitsky. And actually, at the time, my colleagues at the Technion thought, you know, uh, well, people thought maybe everything is false. It just could be true that things, you know, you have uh, abelian, two-step nilpotent, maybe something much larger comes next. You know, it could, it could be true. But then, 
Then it turned out that you can fix the, the finite field one, conjecture a tiny bit, and then it turns out to be true. Um, and, and, and then finally, actually, also the, the, the theorem for Z mod NZ is true as well. So I think I'll stop. Yeah, that's what you asked me before. So, so it, it, it's true that if you're just interested in, um, in um, uh, arithmetic progressions, for example, then, um, uh, then, you, the, then the, the theorem, the green tau theorem, actually holds for any subset of positive, rel, positive density inside what is called a pseudo-random set. It's true for, from, from the, the, if you're just looking for progressions, like the Semiretti theorem, then this holds for a much larger class of sets, not only for the primes themselves. Oh, uh, but the, the key he, thing here is if you, if you want to calculate asymptotics or if you want to understand non-homogeneous equations, then there is an input here that comes from the primes themselves. It doesn't sit in, not, in the inverse, not in the inverse conjecture and the inverse theorem for the Gowers norm, but in the calculation. You, at the very end, I said you need to calculate this projection of the characteristic function of the primes onto the nil factor. And you can do that for the primes, and maybe you can do that for some other special sets. But this is a very special property of the primes. And the fact that this actually sits only in the periodic part, in only, only in the kind of smaller, smaller characteristic factor, even not, is, is, uh, is something that is very special for the primes. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So it has been computed for other? Yeah, it has been computed. It has been computed for all kinds of other arithmetic functions. So you can do that for divisor functions, and you can do that for, for other interesting functions. And they also, for, for, for many, <laughs> well, I don't know any example where you have some interesting arithmetic fun function where the, the projection is larger. It's not in this smaller factor of periodic. That would be actually very interesting. <laughs>